Now we're going to look at the exit of the cranial nerves from the skull. And one of the most convenient ways of doing this is by drawing a circle, or in fact an oval, that passes through the medial ends of the lesser wings of the sphenoid, through the petrous temporal bones, and the centre of the foramen magnum. And in fact, all but three of the internal skull foramina lie on this line. We can start by identifying the optic canal between the lesser wings and the body of the sphenoid. And passing through here, we have the optic nerve, the ophthalmic artery, the three layers of dura, and CSF. And we mustn't forget that on the ophthalmic artery, there are sympathetic fibres. Then number two is the superior orbital fissure between the lesser and greater wings of the sphenoid. And through here, we have the cranial nerves three, four, six, and the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, and also leaving the orbit, the superior ophthalmic vein. Next, we have foramen rotundum, which is labelled three, and through here, we have the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve, passing into the pterygopalatine fossa. And then number four is the foramen ovale for the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve and the lesser petrosal nerve. Five is the foramen spinosum, through which enters into the skull the middle meningeal artery, a branch of the maxillary artery. Six is the internal acoustic or auditory meatus, into which passes the facial nerve and the vestibulocochlear nerve and the labyrinthine artery. Seven is the jugular foramen, and through here we have cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11, and the sigmoid sinus passing through to become the internal jugular vein. And from the anterior end of this foramen passes the inferior petrosal sinus, which just below the foramen joins the internal jugular vein. It is the main exit of venous blood from the cavernous sinus. And then number eight is the hypoglossal canal, through which passes the hypoglossal nerve. And then finally, we have the foramen magnum on this line, through which a large number of structures pass, the most important of which are the lower medulla becoming the spinal cord, the vertebral arteries, the spinal roots of the accessory nerve, the spinal arteries, both anterior and posterior, the tectorial membrane, which is the upper end of the posterior longitudinal ligament, the meninges and the CSF, and then ligaments which are attached to the upper part of the dens, which include the apical and alar ligaments. And then finally, we said that there are three foramina which are not on this oval line, and they include number 10, which is the foramen lacerum. And we've said that the internal carotid artery exits through this. We might add that the deep petrosal nerve, which consists of sympathetic fibres off the artery, pass and join with the greater petrosal nerve to make the nerve of the pterygoid canal, which then enters the pterygoid canal to reach the pterygopalatine fossa. And then number 11 is the foramen cecum, a single midline foramen, which is the site of the beginning of the superior sagittal sinus and sometimes has an emissary vein passing through it. And then lastly, we have the cruviform plate of the ethmoid, number 12, through which the olfactory nerves pass, surrounded by small stems of dura to reach the nasal cavity, and also passing upwards and downwards through the cribiform plate are the anterior ethmoidal artery and nerve. Just to re-emphasize that the nerves damaged in raised intracranial pressure are firstly the sixth cranial nerve passing upwards 
from the brain stem towards the cavernous sinus and therefore is easily stretched. And then also the fourth cranial nerve as it runs along the anterior edge of the tentorium cerebelli also to enter the cavernous sinus. And then finally the nerve that matters most in the unconscious patient, the ocular motor nerve, again passing into the roof of the cavernous sinus. And now we have the opportunity to just check on the various other cranial nerves that we can see on this image. We can see the olfactory nerves lying with their bulbs over the cribriform plate. They can see the optic nerve entering the optic canal the ocular motor nerve entering the roof of the cavernous sinus, the trochlear nerve, and then the three parts of the trigeminal nerve entering into a small cave of dura just beneath the posterior end of the cavernous sinus where lies the trigeminal ganglion. The abducent nerve can be seen on the clivus and then the facial and vestibulocochlear nerve can be seen entering the internal acoustic meatus, and then nerves 9, 10 and 11 leaving through the jugular foramen and note the nerves that are ascending through the foramen magnum to join these and that is the spinal root of the accessory nerve. And then finally we have the hypoglossal nerve which consists of several small twiglets. Now when it comes to looking at the cranial nerves in more detail, by far the best way is to put them into various categories. So if we have the 12 nerves listed in front of us, we can start off by naming the nerves which are special sensory. And this consists of smell, sight and balance. Now those nerves are the olfactory nerve for smell, the optic nerve for sight, and the vestibulocochlear nerve for hearing and balance. Looking at the next category, we find in blue the somatic motor nerves. And these are three, ocular motor, four, the trochlear, and six, the abducent. And finally, number 12, which is the hypoglossal. These nerves are all supplying somatic muscles and have no sensory components. Moving down to the buff-colored nerves, we see the trigeminal nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve, and these are both somatic sensory. Indeed, the trigeminal nerve is the main sensory nerve for the head, with its three main divisions, both on the face and in deeper tissues. The glossopharyngeal nerve is somatic sensory for the oropharynx. And then lastly, we have motor nerves that supply the muscles that arise in the branchial or pharyngeal arches, and we call these branchiomotor. There are some of these branchiomotor fibers which are carried for the muscles of mastication by the mandibular division of the trigeminal. And then there are the similar fibers in the facial nerve for the muscles of facial expression. And then the glossopharyngeal has a single muscle, the stylopharyngeus, which is branchiomotor. And the vagus carries branchiomotor fibers, which arise in the cranial root of the accessory nerve and join the vagus just below the jugular foramen. These fibers supply muscles of the palate and larynx and pharynx. I hope you'll find this division based on their function much more useful than simply learning 12 cranial nerves straight off and having to remember all the details of them. We're now going to look at, with more detail at two particular nerves and these are the trigeminal nerve and the facial nerve. So starting with the trigeminal nerve we can look at the distribution of its sensory fibers on the face. And an easy way to remember the meeting point of the three main branches on the lateral side of the head is to say that the outer canthus of the eye 
is supplied by the lacrimal nerve, which is a branch of 5A, or the ophthalmic division. Just posterior to this is the hairless temple, supplied by the zygomaticotemporal nerve, a branch of the maxillary division. And then posterior to this is the hairy temple, which is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve, a branch of the mandibular division. It's worth noting at this point that it is the trigeminal nerve and its branches that carry all the parasympathetics to their end organs. If we look at more detail of the distribution of these sensory nerves on the face, we see that the ophthalmic division has five branches, the maxillary three and the mandibular three, so that the ophthalmic division has a supratrochlear and a supraorbital nerve, and then the lacrimal nerve supplying the outer canthus of the eye, and there's an infratrochlear branch just below the medial end of the orbit, and then there's the external nasal nerve, which is the terminal branch of the anterior ethmoidal nerve. And then in the maxillary area, there's a zygomaticotemporal and a zygomaticofacial and an infraorbital nerve. And lastly, on the mandibular distribution, there's the auriculotemporal nerve, the buccal nerve, and the mental nerve, which is the end branch of the inferior alveolar nerve. At this point, it's probably worth looking into the infratemporal fossa to see further branches of the trigeminal nerve. As we do so, having removed much of the anterior part of the angle of the mandible, we can see that there is a muscle with two heads to it, which lies almost horizontal in this area, and that is the lateral pterygoid, a muscle which pulls the head of the mandible forwards and thus opens the mouth by rotation of the mandible on the sphenomandibular ligament. A muscle passing more vertically downwards is the medial pterygoid, and this again has a deep and superficial head. And then a little anterior to these muscles is the pterygomandibular ligament, or raphe, from which anteriorly buccinator arises and posteriorly the superior constrictor. And the two nerves that are very obvious within this infratemporal fossa are the inferior alveolar nerve passing into the mandibular foramen and then passing through the mandible to exit anteriorly through the mental foramen as the mental nerve. Then anterior to the inferior alveolar nerve is the lingual nerve, which is passing to the tongue and also carrying the corda tympani to supply the submandibular gland. And now let's look more carefully at the facial nerve. And we've tried to indicate the importance of its various constituents by altering the size of the text. So it is essentially a nerve supply of the muscles of facial expression. But it also carries parasympathetic for both the corda tympani and the greater petrosal nerve. It also has a considerable amount of taste and it has a little bit of somatic sensation, the importance of which is seen in the Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Here to remind you, we can see the facial nerve leaving the cranial cavity through the internal acoustic meatus. From there, it passes through the middle ear and out through the stylomastoid foramen before supplying the muscles of facial expression. If we look at this in more detail, we can see the yellow facial nerve passing into the internal acoustic meatus and reaching the geniculate ganglion before turning posteriorly, initially to run through the middle ear, initially on the medial wall and then on the posterior wall before passing out through the stylomastoid foramen. The main stem then enters the parotid gland and passes through onto the face as the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, mandibular and cervical branches. 
However, it does have some somatic motor branches to the stapedius muscle within the middle ear. And then having emerged from the stylomastoid foramen, it supplies the posterior belly of the occipitofrontalis and both the posterior belly of the digastric and stylohyoid muscles. But as we said before, it also carries parasympathetic fibres. This is usually regarded as being in the nervous intermedius, which joins with the main facial nerve at the geniculate ganglion. From that ganglion, the greater petrosal nerve leaves to pass through the petrous temporal bone and then into the pterygoid canal to reach the pterygopalatine fossa. The corda tympani leaves the facial nerve just before it passes through the floor of the middle ear. It then passes backwards and upwards across the handle of the malleus, across the pars flaxida of the tympanic membrane, and emerges out of the skull through the petrotympanic fissure, where it soon joins the lingual nerve and is carried to the submandibular gland for secretor motor activity and then reaches the tongue on the lingual nerve to bring back taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The cell bodies of all taste involving these two nerves, the greater petrosal and the cordotympani, are in the geniculate ganglion before passing centrally to reach the tractus solitaris. On this next image, we can see the problems that might arise if there are lesions in the facial nerve at various points. If we lose the facial nerve beyond the stylomastoid foramen, then clearly we will get the loss of muscles of facial expression. If we have damage to the facial nerve just before it gives off the nerve to stapedius, then we'll get hyperacusis and be sensitive to noises and not be able to dampen down the stapes. At that spot also we will lose the corda tympani and we will have absent taste in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. And then if the lesion is proximal to the exit of the greater petrosal nerve, we'll have a dry eye because the lacrimal gland is supplied indirectly from the pterygopalatine ganglion. When we look at the muscles of facial expression, they can be regarded as essentially two sphincters, one around the eye and one around the mouth. So if we were testing the muscles, we would first ask them to firmly close the mouth using orbicularis oris, facial nerve, blow out the cheeks, which would be buccinator, which would also be facial nerve. We could wrinkle the forehead, close the eyes, or smile, all achieved by the facial nerve. So when we test such functions in a normal patient, we can see that there is full activity in all these muscles and that they are symmetrical. If, however, all these activities are absent, then we're dealing with a lower motor neurone lesion on that side, and this is likely to be such as a Bell's palsy. If, however, the upper face seems to be perfectly normal, but we've lost the activity in the lower face, in which the patient may not be able to smile or show his teeth, then we're dealing almost certainly with an upper motor neurone lesion, such as a stroke. Now this is because the upper face, in the presence of a stroke, here for instance on the left side, gives normal activity in the upper face because the right motor cortex also controls the upper face, whereas in the lower face the control is unilateral and contralateral and therefore we will lose the activity on the opposite side. So this is an upper motor neuron supranuclear facial nerve lesion involving the lower face but not the upper face because the upper face is supplied bilaterally. Now let's have a look at the cranial nerve nuclei in the brainstem. 
The brainstem itself is made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And on the left-hand side of this diagram, we have the sensory nuclei, whereas on the right side, we have the motor nerves. The sensory nuclei are made up of three parts. There's the very large trigeminal nucleus, which consists of an upper mesencephalic part, which is for proprioception, a central part, which is the chief nucleus, which is for touch, and the spinal part, which is for pain and temperature. And then in green, we have the vestibular and cochlear nuclei for the eighth cradial nerve. And then in blue, the nucleus or tractus solitarius, which is the central connections for taste and the baroreceptors. On the motor side, the purple nuclei are the parasympathetics, and these are output into the edinger vesvar nucleus, the fibres being carried by the ocular motor nerve, the superior salivary nucleus, which are carried by the facial nerve, and the inferior salivary nucleus, which is carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve. The yellow nuclei are the somatic cranial nerves, which are the ocular motor nerve, the trochlea, the abducent, and the hypoglossal. And then finally, in brown, are the branchiomotor fibers associated with the pharyngeal arches, and these are in the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, in the facial nerve, and in the nucleus ambiguous, which supplies the vagus and the cranial root of the accessory.